40 minutes. Please, somebody stay behind. Um, anybody might be, I will be taking questions, so even if they're for somebody else, I'll answer them. Um, Alright, let's start. It looks, like, looks like we might have questions. This is great, because at a Q&A, it really helps the A if there's a Q. So, start you right there. Hi, so you told me to ask Rob if, why he hates birth. Yeah, he really hates birth. Yes, I did. So yeah. I don't know why he said it. This man, Rob is a man of great mystery. He, he's small like squirrel, but angry like muskrat. And, um, and I don't know, here's the true story behind, how many people are aware that Rob hates Perth? This is sitting in Australia, I know you know this, he hates, Rob doesn't like Perth. It's a crying shame because I think the people of Perth, boy, I'm pretty sure they go by Perthans. I'm gonna say they do. Perthans are good people. Man, I love the Saint of Perthans. Um, Rob and I were someone, were some, we were in Australia, and it was our first trip to Australia. We were doing a convention, and we were standing together at, much like that cocktail event we did last night where we kind of mix and mingle with everybody. Robbie and I are mixing and mingling. And we, were, we went up to this wicked lady who was very nervous, leaning excited, like you know, happy, but, but kind of nervous. A little bit of emotion, a little bit of emotion coming out in this, uh, in this event. And she choked up a little bit, and she's like, oh, Rich, it's, it's really great to meet you. Uh, you. You've never been to Australia, you're finally here. I'm so, I'm so excited to meet you. And of course, I'm trying, you know, trying to, obviously, very gracious and, and, and want to comfort the young lady. And I said, That's, thank you so much, it means so much to me. Love visiting your country. It's just a beautiful, beautiful nation. You have. Where, where are you from in Australia? And she says, I'm from Perth. And I go, oh, Rob hates Perth. <laughs> Now, I know the question might be, why would you say that? I don't know. I'm a trained professional. Act first, ask questions later. And so, I said it. But at that point, I'm committed. Rob hates Perth. It's out there now, you know what I mean? I can't take it back, it's been said. And when it's been said, it must be true if it's out there. If the internet has taught us anything, then once it's out there, it's gotta be true, right? So, I said Rob hates Perth, and Rob goes, I don't hate Perth, I really, I don't even know Perth, I've never been to Perth, I'm sure if I've been to Perth, I love Perth a lot, I really don't, Rich, I, don't, I like Perth. I, you know what, I'm a big, I mean, I'm, you're talking about Mr. Perth here. And, and she literally looked at him and she said, through tears, we take offense to that. <laughs> and I said, Robbie, this is not the time. And afterwards, he's like, why would you say that? I'm like, I don't know, it just happened. But the good news is, Rob, when you Google it, people are already making shirts, and they were. There was already shirts, and Rob went, mm, and said, Rob hates Perth in Australia. So I'm like, at this point, it's a branding opportunity, buddy. I can't really put the toothpaste back in the tube. Uh, you now hate Perth. And so that's where the, the Rob hates Perth comes from. You mentioned the, uh, the tour, you suggested the Rob Apology Tour. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought that was a great idea. Rob could go, I thought Rob maybe with the band or something, he could do a tour of Australia called the Rob Apology Tour. <laughs> Basically Rob apologizing to the country of Australia, specifically the good people of Perth, who are good people. Don't let Rob fool you. They're good people. Rob's disdain for the people of Perth shouldn't influence your feelings about Perth. For starters, I would say, Go to Perth. If you can't go to Perth, meet a Perth. You will find that they are lovely. And then you'll think to yourself, Rob is off base here. He really shouldn't hate Perth. But if you don't have that opportunity, Rob could do this on his own by doing this Rapology tour, which I think would be a huge hit. And honestly, great way to mend fences between Rob and the good people of Australia. So hopefully, Rob will do this because he really has a lot to apologize for. He, he's insulted a town in a very, very uh, beautiful nation and in a beautiful country. He's been nothing but warm to us and, and it's, quite frankly, I find it offensive. So yeah, I think it's something we need to resolve and thank you for reminding me. We're going to get work on that apology tour. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Hello. Oh. Being a teacher myself, I would like to know what is something you are good at or maybe even proud of teaching others? Oh, not Italian. 
I made the, I, I, in, my, in my attempt to learn Italian, I'm trying to learn Italian, but I'm, I'm not doing well. I confused the word learn and teach. So I was walking around yesterday saying, I teach Italian. <laughs> and anybody who heard me say, I teach Italian, would know immediately how I said that. I don't teach Italian. So somebody kindly corrected me. I'm like, oh, wait, no, I learned Italian. I learned Italian. Sorry. Um, something I would be good at teaching. Hmm. Um, that's tough. I think I'm a good student. I don't know if I'm a good teacher. Um, <clears throat> you know, parenting is, uh, I, obviously the teaching profession, by the way, thank you for being a teacher. It's a beautiful profession. Yeah, and thank you for choosing that. For, I, don't know, I don't know what age, I don't know who, where, why, but whatever you do and for whomever, thank you. It's a beautiful profession and it's necessary and it's underappreciated, at least in the United States. So thank you so much for, for doing it. I tell you, if COVID taught us anything, it's that teachers and nurses have been in the shadows too long, are way, way underappreciated. Because as, as I sat there doing homeschool for my three boys and trying to navigate their emotional journey, I could not imagine doing that for children who were not of my bloodline and were larger in number, <laughs> 25 and not three. Uh, it's a special, it's a special calling, so thank you. Um, but what would I teach? Um, I don't know. I mean, and I'm not being glib here. I, I, I don't think I'm an expert at anything. But I do enjoy being a parent and having those conversations about the, A, when they're small, the simple things. I enjoy teaching each one of my children. I have three sons. I enjoy teaching them each to throw a baseball. I enjoyed um, teaching my oldest boy to drive a car, which he's now driving a car. I enjoyed that process. I enjoyed taking the journey with them as they move through their life. And that's not one specific thing. And that also doesn't mean I'm all that good at it. But I'm their dad, so I'm all they've got. <laughs> In terms of the male influence, at least. My wife is obviously awesome and does the heavy lifting. But I think that... Uh, if, if one can say that one's a good teacher because they find joy in it, then I find joy in being a dad. I find joy in, in having those moments. I find joy in having Fletcher meet you all and come here. He's with me on this convention. I, have, I find joy in being the first base coach for Frank's baseball team. I, fi I find joy in helping Steve drive and helping him work on his job application for summer employment. All the things that I, I have done that my dad did for me, that I now do for my sons, I find joy in that. And whatever they glean from it is great because, you know, from your parents you learn what you like and what you don't like, what you will do, what you won't do, you know? I mean, there are things that I probably do for my children that they will carry with them, and there are things that they will reject. And that's just the nature of the beast. It's, an, it's not an exact science. It's an ever-evolving obstacle course uh, that you're constantly navigating. So it, the short answer is, I don't know. But the long answer is, whatever I think could be helpful in their journey forward, I enjoy sharing. And that's probably as close to teaching as I should ever be allowed to get. <laughs> Thank you for your question. <laughs> yeah. um, so given episodes like stuck in the middle of you, they're with you, that you directed, I take it you're a Quentin Tarantino fan? I am. But so my question is, yeah, have yeah. you ever met him? No, I never met Tarantino. No. And I'm a big Tarantino fan. And Somebody asked me about that episode earlier today, and just so Davy Perez get the, gets the credit he's due, the writer of that episode, it was written to be a tip of the cap to Quentin Tarantino. Um, a lot of times, there, there are cinematic elements that I'll bring to a show, an episode of television that I direct, and certainly I leaned in on the uh, Tarantino elements of that episode, but I, it wasn't my idea. 
It, the, the idea was born in the paper. It was it was written by Danny Perez. It was meant to be an homage to Tarantino or reflect Tarantino's tone, and which was great for me because I love Tarantino. I love his style. I admire him. I look up to him. When I was in my twenties, I thought he was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And so it was fun for me to try to think like, what would Tarantino do? <laughs> but. Uh, I've never, I've never met him, no, unfortunately. But do you sometimes um, ask yourself what would Tarantino do in other episodes, like other works you don't? Um, no, not really, and that's not because I don't, I mean, you know, sometimes people ask, like, who are your influences as a director, or who do you think you lean on as an influence? And I think it's an almost impossible question to answer, at least for me, because I'm an amalgamation, my brain, all of our brains, are an amalgamation of everything that we have seen and learned and, and witnessed. If you go to a museum and see a thousand painters and then you paint, somewhere in there is the influence of the things you have seen. Um, for me, I've just grown up loving movies, and I think I'm as influenced by Carl Reiner as I am by Wes Anderson. You know, th whatever films I've loved are in there. So whether it's executing a joke, executing an action sequence, executing a a dream sequence or anything else, you know, I'm, I'm as likely to pull from Bob Singer and Phil Segrecia as I am from Quentin Tarantino, um, because I admire their work tremendously too, and they do it in the format that I do it, which is television. Um, so I, I have, but that's not to say that I haven't seen a scene and thought, ooh, this idea, which was born out of somewhere, which might be an influence from a Tarantino thing, this, this pacing or this style, I'm going to go with that. And I might not even know that it's a Tarantino that I'm pulling from, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Because once it's all in the grab bag, it just becomes what you know. I think also the episode where you're acting as Loki, is Loki that also has a very much Tarantino style, Kill Bill style episode. Of yeah, yeah, it is, for sure. Yeah, there's definitely a Kill Bill style of that one, too. You're right, I forgot about that. Um, for sure. And that was also by writer design. Meredith Glenn wrote that one. and and, and she, you know, sort of referenced some of that as well. I mean, he, for my generation of filmmakers, he was just such a big impact player. You know, for all of us in our early 20s, when he started making movies, it was just like, whoa, who's this guy who's just doing edgy, interesting stuff? So it's impossible not to get influenced by him. But I'm also incredibly, I'm a huge Wes Anderson fan. So there's a lot that, like, optimism is definitely Wes Anderson. You know, there, there are things in, in episodes where I've used as much symmetry as humanly possible. Heck, we did, I can't remember the name of the episode. Um, it's where Lilith shows up and Jay Gable plays two characters, plays, uh, uh, my uh, say it again? Our Father, our, no. Our Father, our Thou? Who are in heaven. Oh, who are in heaven, that, that episode. Our Father, who are in heaven. That episode, we did all kinds of uh, Wes Anderson sized up. We did a Moonrise Kingdom homage with the camping outfits and the beret and the Lilith and all this stuff. So you just kind of end up being. That's one of the great things about Supernatural. It's not CSI. CSI is one style. You're doing CSI, you're doing CSI. Which, by the way, that's great. That's how that show is built. Shows like that, procedurals like that. You don't change genres, you don't change styles. Supernatural afforded the ability to do creative things and still be honest and true to the story and the characters. That's really cool in TV. Really rare in TV. And that's why Supernatural was able to re continually reinvent itself, not just story-wise, but visually. And then bounce back to where it had been successfully and move between the two. Thank you for your question, by the way. ask you this the other day at the Roman holiday, but considering you were in New Orleans filming Winchesters, if you had to give one of these up cuisine-wise, which one would it be? Gumbo, jambalaya, po'boys, beignets, or crawfish? Beignets. Yeah. Uh, so, the question is based on the fact that we shot Winchesters in New Orleans, which is a culinary mecca. The, the food in New Orleans is unbelievable, and it's unique. If anybody, anybody been to New Orleans? All right, anybody want to go to New Orleans? 
Yeah, add it to your bucket list. It's one of America's coolest cities, and it's certainly unique, um, and has amazing food from the from the most expensive restaurant to the tiny bar serving whatever they have behind uh, the door in the kitchen. Everything is phenomenal. It's just such a good, such a good food town. Um, I beignets. I'm not a huge beignet fan. I'm not a big sweets guy, for starters. And secondly, it's like. I went to get beignets when I was down there, and I felt like, well, I should probably get a beignet. That's like one of the things they do, right? And I'd been there years, decades before and had them, but this time I was spending all this time down there. I'm like, I'm going to get beignets. And they're great, but they're, they, you get like three, and they're, they're like this big, covered in powdered sugar and solid, and I get like two bites in, and then that was, that's all I needed. It was like more, it was... A lot of beignet. I, I feel like I've been yayed. <laughs> and I don't need to be yayed again. Um, but I did have some interesting stuff there. There was a, oh, what was the restaurant called? I can't remember. But I had, uh, um, you guys have heard of chicken and dumplings. It's a southern dish. They had rabbit and dumplings. They had alligator down there. Really interesting things. And all really good. Not, not, creepy or anything, just like they just work them into the how they cook and it's just fantastic. So the easy answer, beignets. <laughs> I'll grow large with the other dishes you mentioned. Because I actually saw a meme earlier on today and it literally says, Oh, look, an invasive species, Louisiana's. Ooh, how does it taste? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That sounds exactly right. They know what to do with those critters. Grill them. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're right there. Hi. Hey. Um, I really like your EP, your first um, EP, <laughs> hopefully. And I was wondering if there's an echo strike coming up too. You might have time to write more music. Oh, the the the, the music. Oh, um, so yeah, actually, um, I already have during COVID. I wrote a bunch of music. During so I have a I have a band called Dick Jr. and the Volunteers. It's a country band. <laughs> Jason Manns helped produce the album, Billy Moran plays on the album, Rob Benedict wrote a song for the album. It's a really fun, if you like country music, it's a fun record. Um, we're doing a second record, uh, and this time it's not, Billy's not just playing on it, he's helping produce it. So Billy and I are, are, are working on the record together, and the songs are already written, actually, because I wrote them all during lockdown, but we just haven't had time to get to them. First of all, lockdown, he couldn't do anything. And then I've been busy and now we're in the, right, uh, the strike. It, it, so our goal right now is to do it in August. That's what we're, that's what we're trying to do, that we're targeting that. So, so we're hoping to have it done by the fall. And really excited, we already, have, we already have a couple of the songs recorded because we recorded more than we needed on the last album. So I've got a couple of songs in that and then I've got a bunch of songs that I've written in lockdown and we're going to we're going to put out another record. Yeah. Awesome. But Emma will be on it again. Oh, heck yeah. Oh, awesome. Emma will be on it. Emma uh, and I worked on a song together during lockdown. We kind of would just talk to each other and FaceTime. And I, I, I think Emma's one of the most talented people I know. I mean, I, her voice is stunning. Mm -hmm. This is Emma Fitzpatrick we're talking about. If you don't know who, if, who Emma Fitzpatrick is, go to your Spotify, look up Emma Fitzpatrick. Listen to her music. She did for one of Jason Mann's album, one of Jason Mann's uh, you know covers of Friends albums. She did a cover of Patsy Cline's "I Fall to Pieces" that will melt you. It'll bring you to your knees. Patsy Cline, for starters, is a dangerous person to cover because she has a voice like honey being poured from a pitcher. You know, it's gorgeous, and that song is so dramatic and so elegant and. Emma is such a magical cover of it uh, that it's, it's really special. And if, if, some, if it ever found its way to a movie soundtrack or, or anything that got it some exposure, she'd be up the food chain doing what she wants to do more often than she's doing it now. She has, and she has a lot of original music on Spotify and she sings on the Dick Jr. record on a, on a couple of songs. Um, one that we wrote together, the Going Straight. Yeah, that was really cool. Um, that was a that was a fun. So we did a I did a music video for that song. 
going straight. Yeah, that's been funny, yeah. Yeah, and we did that during lockdown with cell phones. It was super fun. Yeah. Um, if you want to see a cell phone project, Google going straight and look at the music video. It's really, really a fun little exercise in how to be creative when you can't leave your house. Um, but anyway, Emma will definitely be involved, and for, you know, she's a she's a volunteer. She's part of the Dick and the Volunteers. She's a crucial member, so she'll be involved, and a lot of the people you know will be involved, and it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it, and I'm looking forward to working with Billy as a producer. It's going to be awesome. Thank you for your question. Right there, you. I, I love the story you just related about you and Jensen, and I wonder if you have another to share. For us. Uh, a story of me and Jensen, let me think. Um, hmm. What would it be? I mean, we spend a lot of time together. We've traveled an awful lot together. Um, hmm. I'm trying to think if I have anything else that's like a funny Jensen shareable uh, <laughs> story. Not necessarily Um, all right. Uh, you know, is it, it, you know, we've all been through some shit together over the years. And one of the worst moments, one of the darker moments was Rob Benedict having a stroke. Very dark period, obviously hard on Rob Benedict and his family, very hard on Robin But shocking to those of us who were with him and, and, and hanging out. And one of those guys who was here was when we were in uh, Toronto, Canada. And one of the guys who was there for it was Jensen. And I just tell this story because it was a great moment in all of us sort of coming together to do what we can in a situation where we couldn't do much. Um, but when it all happened and we got Rob to the hospital, I. Rob was in critical care, had this medicine in his system, and we were kind of waiting around to get his wife up to Canada and all these things, and Rob couldn't talk. So Jensen and I, Jensen came to the hospital, and Jensen and I stood over Rob and just sort of helped Rob not feel um, scared, which you wouldn't feel if you had had this happen. We just sort of stood over him, and we're having a conversation with him without him. Does that make sense? Like, Hey, Bobby, how about those Minnesota Vikings? Jensen, you know they got a new quarterback? Damn right, I know. You know, that guy's got an arm. He's got an arm, doesn't he, Bobby? Yeah, I'm telling you what, that kid can throw. We had like an, you know, a, a, several hours of conversation where we were just, you, we would just bounce nickels off Bobby, conversation-wise, just so he could feel involved. And he just kind of nod, like, mm -hmm, you know, and you know, we, can, we can look back at it and find the joy in it now. It wasn't funny at the time. It wasn't fun at the time. It was nerve-wracking at the time. Um, I always feel like Jensen and I react to crisis the same way. There's that. There was a time the engine exploded on the airplane when Jensen and I, so we, so we, we were doing that. Have you guys heard this story? I know. So Jensen, so Misha finished his last scene, his last moment on the series Supernatural when I was correcting. And it was the episode where he confesses his love to Dean, right? Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful piece of acting by both Jensen, but Misha did the heavy lifting there. Just gorgeous. And hard scene, late into the night, two in the morning, and Misha, the, the crew, you know, they were all exhausted. They gave him a nice send-off, like, thank you for all your years of work. We'll see you at the wrap party, blah, blah, blah. Misha's emotionally exhausted, because he would be. Jensen's emotionally exhausted, because he was would be as well, very buried in the scene. And Alex Calvert had, had been shooting earlier in the day and was still there. And so Alex, Misha, Jensen, and myself all boarded the plane that uh, Jared always flies, Jared's plane, but Jared wasn't flying with us. It was the four of us going to Las Vegas. So we get on the plane and we're flying and we're about 20 minutes out and it's, and Misha had been joking, like, well, I'm dead, guys. Well, you know, that's it, I'm dead. We're kind of just letting the air out of the balloon, as it were. And we're sitting, I was sitting across from Misha, and now Cal sitting across from Jensen. And we're flying, 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 and we hear, 
bang, and a big blast of light on one side, and the plane goes, <laughs> and we go, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Jensen says, should we be concerned <laughs> with the pilot? And he's saying, Yes, you should be concerned. Please put your seatbelts on. We're going to find our way to emergency land this plane. We just lost an engine. And we're like, the oh, fuck? <laughs> and I told Misha, I'm like, yeah, you might just have died. Um, tad on the nose, don't you think? But it was, so it was Misha, me, Al Cal, and, and Jensen. And I just remember like looking at Jensen, and then he and I are both like, okay, all right, yep, no problem. We're gonna circuit this bad boy around, we're gonna land it, we're all gonna be good. But there was a certain sense of tension in the air and everybody handled it beautifully. Al and, and Misha were a little quieter and Jensen was a little more football coach and I was a little more assistant football coach. And it's just, it just it was interesting to me that we just had sort of Rob situation, that plane situation, we have similar reactions. And I think that's kind of interesting. I think it's one of the things that uh, connects us as, as people beyond just coworkers and, and, you know, people who met through work. I think it, it connects our humanity to each other. And I've had similar situations with, with Jared, not near death experiences, but I'm saying, <laughs> I've gone through things with him where I feel like we're stopping all the trains in Europe, where we're doing things, we're like, we're bonding, we're having bonding, that's what we're doing here. We're also destroying people's vacations, but that's beside the point. Um, and so I think those, those serious moments, we, we can laugh, we can joke, we can connect our lives through humor like we did earlier, but really the through line is when the shit hits the fan, who do you turn to, how do you respond, and how do they respond back? And I think we've been through enough stuff as a unit, as a group, as a squad, where we've seen each other's true colors and we all like what we see. And we all admire what we see. And everybody handles it differently. Two of the things that I think are interesting about those scenarios I just painted. One, Jared wasn't on that plane, which <laughs> makes us think that maybe, <laughs> maybe there is subterfuge, you know what I mean? Maybe, maybe he filled with the engine. I can't prove it, I'm just saying maybe. And secondly, one of our favorite parts of the Rob Benedict stroke story, which we have, but like, again, we find joy in the negative because obviously, obviously it was a tough situation, but Rob has recovered beautifully and we're on the other side of it now. We can, we can enjoy the experience. But through all of that, while Jensen and I were, well, you know, I got Rob to the hospital. While we're, well, Misha's trying to get Molly across the border. While Jensen's helping with all that and Jensen and I are talking over Rob, all these things. Next day, all you see on Twitter is, thank God for Jared. <laughs> Not a goddamn thing. He wasn't there. <laughs> Jared fell, went home, went to sleep, woke up to 40 texts going, we're losing Rob, we're losing Rob. We lost Rob. 